Hey there guys and welcome back to Unjaded Jade. Welcome to the ultimate how to revise video as critiqued by science and the underlying principles of the science of learning. Your gal has done quite a bit of research um, for this video. For university we had to do a lot of reading into the science of learning and like how actually best to revise to like retain information and use it in like novel contexts. I'm gonna leave some of the sources in the description below but I'm basically gonna talk a bit about the underlying principles behind revision and then I'm gonna take all the common revision methods, everything from like rereading, highlighting, making notes, explaining to yourself, blurting, flashcards, note taking, practice papers, all of them. And we're gonna sit and we're gonna critique them based off of this criteria of like science of learning. And basically try and unravel what is the best way to revise. The pioneer of experimental science of memory was this really cool guy. His name was Herman Ebbinghaus. A lot of further research is based off of the research that he conducted. A lot of stuff I'm gonna discuss is also based off of Stephen Coslin. According to Stephen Coslin's research, he put learning into like two main maxims of learning. The first he called think it through. It's pretty simple. It's basically the more that you think about something, the more likely you are to remember it. You don't need to like the information, but the more you're thinking about it, you're generally gonna have it in your head. And the second one he called make and use associations. If you can give yourself hooks to recall that information, which are called retrieval cues, then that is another way that you can learn something through associating it to something else. This guy basically went on to list 16 principles, which underlie these two maxim ways of learning. I'm gonna go through some of them pretty rapid fire, so get ready. Okay, so for example, one of the principles under the think it through is having desirable difficulty. Say you're coming to revise something and you are only doing easy problems. It's so easy that it doesn't really require much mental effort. You're not really thinking through the actual content that much, so you're not really learning much through doing it. Whereas if it's slightly harder and you don't actually feel that confident in it, that's sometimes better because it's forcing you to like challenge yourself and really grapple with whatever concept you're trying to get through. And then if it's way too hard, you're not really learning anything. So it's like desirable difficulty is really important. If it's too easy, you will generally learn nothing. There's a principle called the generation effect, which is basically where you have to retrieve information from your brain on a certain topic. Digging information out of your memory, even when it's really hard, instead of first looking at your notes, that is like really useful. You're like strengthening the mental pathways to that information. So sometimes when you know that something is in your brain somewhere, but you just can't remember it, instead of instantly looking into the textbook, just like sit with that like grappling feeling for a bit longer and try and like get as close as you can because in just trying to recall the information that is like strengthening your learning of it. Another principle is called interleaving which is where you intermix different subjects. So you focus a lot on one thing. For example, you focus a lot on French and then straight away after that you'll do maths or something different. It's easier to pay attention for longer periods of time if you're just focusing on like one distinct thing and then you change up your brain a little bit and then you can go back to that thing after. There's a principle called dual codes, which is based off the idea that there are different methods of memory formation. If you're reading text, you should have pictures there. Or if you've made flashcards, try and include diagrams. Okay, moving on to the other maxim, which is making and using associations. There is a principle called chunking. People can store more information when it is in chunks. For example, you've got all these principles, but I'm already chunking it for you into the first ones which I think it through, and the second ones which are make and use associations. And if you were to go again and chunk each of these down, it's a lot easier to remember. For example, imagine if you've got loads of terminology in biology, break it down into like stages of a process and then chunk together memorizing keywords for each stage of the process. So you can bring up, be like, oh, okay, for this stage of the process, I need to know X, Y, Z words. Second one is building on prior association. I actively do this whenever I am trying to learn someone's name. For example, someone says their name is Scarlett. How do I remember that? I think, okay, what can I relate Scarlett to? Scarlett Johansson, this girl, okay, I'm gonna imagine Scarlett Johansson's face on her and like how similar do they look? And almost just have this like really quick thing to yourself like, oh, does she look like Scarlett Johansson? I don't know, da 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 Imagine her face next to Scarlett Johansson's face. Then when I see her again, that like little thing in my head will be like, oh, does she look like Scarlett Johansson? Oh yeah, her name's Scarlett. For example, I met a friend at uni, her name is Uyeza, which is like, I don't know, kind of a hard to remember name. Really pretty though. So I'd break down her name into random things I can remember. So Uyeza, I, I broke it down to like, you, yay. Za? I don't know, Za just was on the end. And I'd picture her, this person I met, pointing at me like, you, yay. 
is that, I don't know, the Zer just is on the end. And then the next time I saw her, I literally had to bring back that mental image of like her pointing at me and going like, yay. And I just remember, oh yeah, you yezer, you yezer. And I do this all the time. <laughs> Another principle is foundational learning. This is where you directly build on what you know. So by adding to your existing knowledge, you're, you're tacking on this new knowledge onto something that you definitely do already know. And like that association helps you understand this stuff by relating it to something you know. There's a principle called deliberate practice, which is basically where you get feedback. Getting feedback is most useful when you actively use that feedback. For example, you're learning Spanish and you get a native speaker to like actively correct your pronunciation. You tend to remember that more if someone is like deliberately correcting you. There's like using examples, which is putting things into a new context. You can do chaining, which is like storytelling. So like you, you make up some story based off of the information. You can create rich retrieval cues, which is like in blurting, for example, sometimes you just use a few keywords to like prompt your memory. You can also do like object association. And just having a few small things to help you get something out of like the folder of your memory on that is useful. And finally, and this is the most crucial kind of principle behind learning, I think. If you've never watched Ali Abdal's videos, go watch Ali Abdal's videos. He's a genius, he's great. And he swears by spaced repetition. And honestly, I completely agree. I think it is like, life-changing. So here is the forgetting curve. As you can see, this is where you've done some revision, okay? You've improved your knowledge, it's going great. But then as time slowly goes on, you do forget that information. But if you catch it at that moment where it is kind of going downhill and you just revise that information literally for like two minutes, then it doesn't take that much effort to know that information well. Whereas if you leave it over too long of a period, you're basically gonna forget the information and like be learning it brand new again. And over time, you can leave longer intervals of reviewing the information. There's an amazing flashcard app called Anki, which is based off of the space repetition idea, based off of what you get wrong and right. It like sorts it into days that you need to go over the information. Basically, whatever technique you go on to adopt, you should include space repetition. If you've done something in class and feel like you understand it fully, make sure you go and review it in like, three days and then okay after that maybe review it in like five days and then like okay review it a week after otherwise like why are you learning it because you're just gonna forget it because us humans don't just memorize everything straight away so we have a better idea of some of the things that are foundational to effective learning. Wow, I sound like a teacher. Let's take the first way a lot of people revise. Rereading. Rereading if done with space repetition isn't the worst thing. You might be building on prior associations. You might be interleaving it with different subjects. However, the issue with rereading comes in the think it through idea of learning. Rereading generally is not the right desirable difficulty, especially when you've got like a test. If you know maybe like 70% of the information now, you should be testing your knowledge to see what specific stuff you don't know. Instead of rereading 70% of what you do know and then trying to find that 30% that you don't and like kind of wasting your time elsewhere. It's not really forcing you to recall any information because you're just kind of passive. Okay, what about explaining to yourself? In general, this is pretty decent. It's not always very easy because you have to drag the information from the depths of your brain. It's often therefore like a desirable difficulty because you have to explain not only the stuff you find easy, but also the stuff you find more difficult. You can use examples to help put it into context. You can use space repetition. Definitely uses the generation effect. Basically, it's pretty good. But in general, people don't often sit with themselves and just talk to themselves and explain stuff. So you could teach a friend or like rant at your mum, or you can do this thing called blurting, which is what I love. It's super active, definitely uses things like the generation effect. You make good retrieval cues because you can make little like key words that you use to like prompt your knowledge. You basically take a chapter or this thing that you're trying to revise. You sit with a whiteboard or a plain piece of paper and you just write everything you can remember from that chapter. You explain processes, you write keywords, draw diagrams from memory, that kind of thing. And then the great thing is because you've forced all of that out of your memory, you can really see what you do and don't know. And then you're putting in this idea of deliberate practice where you're getting immediate feedback because you can compare that to your notes. And you can see if you're right or wrong, and if you're wrong, you can just put it in, and now you know that you need to learn that more. Blurting, for me, is a winner, but it's not easy, which is why it's easy to skip. Highlighting is very similar to rereading. It falls into that kind of passive, 
non-association, no generation effects kind of thing. And it's very time consuming for not much benefit. Okay, and then you have the idea of object association. I made a video on this if you've not seen it. This is time consuming to do, but I think produces very long-term memory on something. This brings in the idea of like chaining and storytelling, having rich retrieval cues. You can do space repetition because you can very easily each day get your object in your head again and like think about it. In general, pretty effective, we stand. Okay, flashcards as one of the blogs in the description will show you are most effective when they are small, connected and meaningful. So don't write an essay on there. You need to like fully process the information yourself first to write like the most condensed thing that you can. If they're kind of connected and you can do a stack of flashcards about like this specific thing in the process, then you're using like chunking. You're using generation effect because you have to recall the information. You can do it spaced repetition very easily. You can make it of desirable difficulty because you can like ask yourself questions. You can use dual codes because you can put like diagrams in. You can use examples, you use retrieval cues. Basically flashcards are good because they're pretty active, but they're only good if you do them well. Note taking is good as long as it's like an active summarization of the information instead of you just like copying something down because then that's basically just nothing and you could be talking to someone and still copying down the information. If you are coming up with like novel examples in your notes for like this piece of information, you're like relating it to something else or coming up with like a metaphor to remember it, you're doing little drawings or diagrams to help you remember it. If you are note taking actively, then it's not bad. It's, it's still not the best because generally it's just not that active. Like your difficulty wise, note taking isn't that hard, but it looks pretty and it's a good grounding to do further things like make flashcards from. Practice papers, we love. That's like deliberate practice. You're getting feedback when you've done it and you look at the mark scheme, you have to actively think. It's like desirable difficulty. Because we live in a world of mark schemes, you can learn from the mark schemes too. You're applying information to a novel context, which really does test your application of it. Yes, we love practice tests. Okay, so I think for me personally, the winners are alerting, practice papers, and flashcards. Okay, so what are our takeaways? I think the main thing is just that if you are doing something that's active and necessarily difficult, then that is what is helping you the most. It's so much easier to like reread things and do chill things and trust me, I do it most of the time because I'm lazy. But I just wanna share the idea of the Pareto principle. I don't know if you've heard of it. People call it the 80-20 principle. Basically, 80% of the results of the learning come from 20% of the work that you put in. So imagine 100% of your time spent revising, that's broken down into things like taking notes, highlighting things, maybe doing some practice papers, maybe doing some blurting. But where you are getting most of that learning from is from the 20% of that 100% revision that is the most active. Just consider that. Do less revision, spend less hours on it. Honestly, we all wanna do that. Just be more productive, be more efficient, and then you have more free time to watch TikTok. Oh, and use space repetition. Download Anki, make a spreadsheet, whatever you do. Just make sure you keep reviewing information at like different intervals. I find it crazy how we never get taught how to study. Even though our success in exams is like, pivotal to getting into good universities. Good luck with the revision. You got this, I believe in you. Bye.